So in this week's Microsoft 365 new features, we've got lots of updates on Teams, including new search, some new defaults in video calls, which you may or may not like, and lots more. And we've also got some smaller bits on the complexities of OneNote. So stick around to the end if you're interested in those. But let's get straight into it. So quick bit on loop before we get into Teams. So like we said in the OneDrive video, which if, if you've not seen it, click here. There's going to be lots of other things showing up in your OneDrive. So loop is now coming out of public preview. And because of that, it's now going to start taking up space in SharePoint and OneDrive. And I'm not sure that people would have used it enough to create large enough loop workspaces for it to be an issue. But there is a way that Microsoft allows you to see well how much space is going to is be taken up by loop workspaces right now that's not adding into your storage space, which is going to transfer over. And uh, the, the easy way to do it, which always makes me giggle, is to run all these PowerShell commands. So I'm not sure how difficult it is just to build a UI to do that if that was important. But I don't think many people would have used loop a lot to create enough storage space that it was going to be an issue anyway. So during the preview, there was a five gigabyte maximum size in a loop workspace, which seems like quite a lot of space considering it's mostly just text and tables Although you can, you know, insert pictures and things. And then now it's going out of public preview and into normal release. It's going to have a one terabyte maximum size in the workspace. So Clearly Microsoft thinks there's going to be lots of stuff in there. I'm not sure if behind the scenes it takes up lots of space by being able to share stuff across uh, platforms. That seems overly large to me, given the other limitations they've got elsewhere. So on to Teams news. Again, like we said in the OneDrive video, the Files app in Teams is going to change into the OneDrive app. But yeah, it looks a bit nicer. I think it's really going to confuse people though. So like we said in the other video, you go into Teams because Teams is a shared thing. And I don't know many people that use the Files app in Teams anyway, but now they've got a OneDrive app. So I'm sure conversations in businesses all around the globe are like, well, OneDrive is for my own stuff and Teams is for shared stuff. So why is my OneDrive app in Teams showing me stuff from Teams? I think it's going to be very confusing and hopefully seems not beyond the wit of man to just rename some stuff to make that not be a conversation or not be a nuance that people need to get their heads around. But yeah, it looks nicer and it's more uniform across the web and file explorer. Next one. So this one was a bit of a odd one, which I don't think has been announced in a blog post anywhere. It only comes through admin center and it says it's got a simplified compose experience for teams. So Teams Compose, apparently, is the heart of collaboration where all Teams messages flow each month. Each month? <laughs> Hopefully people are using it more than a month. It's also the gateway to a wealth of features from Copilot to files, loops, video, and platform apps. I don't know if inside baseball, platform apps is any other app, but yeah. Let's carry on. Apparently, while Teams capabilities have grown by leaps and bounds, the Compose experience has remain, remained largely unchanged. So this update addresses usability, scalability, and information density challenges. Simplify the Compose experience, enhancing usability for various rich authoring scenarios. Don't know what they are. Establishing scalable patterns for all Compose actions. Again, don't know what they are. And optimizing it for your everyday needs. Get ready to enjoy a more seamless and efficient collaboration experience. Now, how, how good can this Compose box be? I mean, this is marketing amazement, isn't it? It's, it's just great. Apparently all Teams users will still be able to do everything they've previously done, so it's not bringing any new, fe any new functionality. But now, accessing these features will be easier and clearer. Neither on the admin center or on the roadmap, it provides a picture of what this new Compose experience is going to be. So we remain in mystery for uh, a couple more weeks, hopefully, until they really say what, what that is going to be. But yeah, I thought it was bizarre. I mean, they've moved the Compose box to the top and moved it back to the bottom, and now I've got a toggle so you can switch between them. Presumably, they're talking about all the apps that are, that are at the bottom of the Compose box, and maybe switching it into announcements, which had already changed with the new teams. Who knows what they've got planned for that? Let me know if you're intrigued in the comments below. I'm Gavin Jones from MeTime. We help make your employees' lives easier. 
by utilizing more of Microsoft tools at work. Put these videos out there so that you can get up to speed with all the Microsoft apps and the latest news to keep up to date. But the next problem you're gonna have is trying to get your whole organization to work in the same way so they can all be more productive together. And that's what help organizations do with change management and consulting from MeTime Services. If you've got 20 knowledge workers or more and you think you've got some pain about not working in the most efficient way, then book a call using the link in the description below. And let's have a chat to see if I can help. One of our most popular products is our modern working assessment and recommendations where we can see how people are working together and then recommend some ways to improve. And if you just want to upskill yourself a little more, then we've got some free courses and some paid courses where you get access to weekly live calls with me so we can go through anything you want in the Microsoft ecosystem. And all of those are in the link in the description below. Another cool feature, which seems like it's bringing everything together, which is again, strange that they just don't seem to do this very quickly or, or at the time that they launch it, such is the way of agile development these days. But, uh, but in Microsoft Stream, any collaborative notes that you go in a Teams meeting recording will now appear in Stream alongside that, that video. I still think it's strange that they've got Stream as a separate thing to house videos, which isn't really separate because now the videos live in SharePoint or OneDrive and it's just showing them up. And then they're saying Stream shows them up in Teams. So presumably it's something in the back end to do with like content delivery and making sure that everything, you know, loads and plays quickly, but for a user, they, they don't care. They just want to see the video. So like I said in, in some previous videos, it's quite jarring when you jumped out, it jumped you out into stream, which is in, in a web browser. You didn't get the same things that you could see in Teams. So hopefully this is starting to align both of those things together. Starting to roll out the preview of the new Teams web client, Edge and Chrome browsers. So it's on the same foundation as the new Teams desktop app and brings Edge and Chrome web users new speed, performance and flexibility when using the new Teams. So they begin to roll it out now, should hopefully have an identical experience, which would be good. Microsoft Teams stream preview and playback in Teams chat and channels. Now this is game changing, but also like five years in the making. It's always strange when you just added a link into Teams of a video and then it didn't show you that video. Even though it was in the Microsoft ecosystem, you had to like click the video link and just jump out. If you pasted a video in, if we pasted the link, either way, it didn't work. You can play it in line in where you were, which was the whole point of Teams is you're doing stuff in one place and you're not context switching all the time. So the fact that this is now coming is a good thing. New experience to search within chat and channels in Teams, which I'm not sure about. I'm keen to hear your thoughts in the comments below, where basically they're jumping you out into a side pane on the right hand side of a chat or a channel to search there. And you can do that with Control F if you're on Windows or Command F if you're on a Mac. And it pops open the search bar on the side. But as you can see from the screenshots, you've already got search bar at the top. So I don't know, I'm kind of thinking, well, if you want to have search at the top and that's your UI across most Microsoft apps, why is then having search in the right hand side benefit? Either have the search bar at the top or search bar on the right. And it seems like there is a bit of real estate on the right hand side that could be better utilized. So it seems like, you know, that's a decent place to put it. This also made me chuckle. Now introduced enhanced captioning and keyword highlighting to aid the discernment of results in chat and channel. I mean, Sounds like Greeters Guild has written some of these updates in Admin Center this week. And you can search in pop-out chats, but simply not in pop-out conversations from a channel yet, but that says that's coming. So yeah, I guess having your search down the right-hand side isn't bad, but it just seems a bit odd that it seems like it doesn't do that from the main search bar at the top. You just have to do a short keyboard shortcut to get the search bar on the right, or go into information about the channel and then click find in channel. If that, that bit of the screen in real estate isn't taken up. Seems like it should just have that sidebar available either through like a little UI pop out rather than a keyboard shortcut and just have it always available. You can search in context or whatever you're looking at, whether it's a chat or a channel, wherever you are. And with that Copilot coming out, it seems like Copilot should just live on the right hand side and that will be able to search for you in the context of what you're looking at anyway. And if you don't pay for Copilot, it seems like it would be easy for that to just turn back into normal search rather than a Copilot, just normal search and keep that on the right hand side. But it seems like having the top box and the right hand side seems a bit 
overly cluttered for, for me. Anyway, onwards, simpler and quicker creation of teams and channels. Now, I'm not a massive fan of this because if you get your team structure right, the need to create new teams is going to be very, very infrequent, I would say, for most organisations. It says, again, there's no screenshots, but it says you can create teams and channels simpler and faster. So it seems like there's some templates you can do with a new team. And then when you create a new team, it's got a different UI to, to help users create channels by putting a create channel option at the top. But we'll see what it looks like when it comes out. So this one is the one I'm not sure about. And let me know your thoughts in the comments below. So there's a new gallery in Teams meetings. And introducing a revamped version of the gallery in Teams meetings and calls, the new gallery will be the default view when users join their meetings. It doesn't say it's the default, that you can change the default for any future meeting, which is what I'm not that keen on. So they can use it without the need of taking an action, which isn't true. It's only if you want the defaults that you don't need to take action. If you don't want the defaults, you need to take action. And hopefully it, it retains what your preference is, because otherwise they're making a change and you need to take an action every single time you join a meeting, which is not cool. So new version introduces a series of changes to help users in their meetings. 16 to 9 aspect ratio for the tiles, so you can see people's hands and things. So that seems fine. So it's strange that it didn't just have your your whole camera view in your tile before anyway, so that one's fine. Audio video mix gallery for, for more inclusive representation. Audio and video users share now the same space by default. Now share the same space by default. Which well, it's not more inclusive. It's like if you want to be included, then put your video on. If you want to be audio, then presume you don't want to be, you know, you, you don't want to be seen. And having a massive tile that's mostly black, apart from the profile picture, it's all, how's that more inclusive? It's like, I can still hear them when they're talking. It still goes purple when they're talking. So it, mixing them all together, I don't see how that's, that's more inclusive. That seems like a backward step. And contradicts the next one, which is a good thing. So meeting rooms are displayed larger than individual participants. In certain meeting sizes, we displayed Microsoft Teams rooms video larger, size than the rest of the participants to give the equivalent weight to participants joining from a meeting room. Well, if that was true, then you would make audio people smaller because they're now taking up more space for their tiny little profile pic head than other people. Yeah, not keen on the audio one. I'm keen on the meeting room one. That sounds like a good thing. These next few then are ones I'm not particularly keen on because it seems like they're just blindly copying things from Zoom where Teams is already better. So first one, you appear next to the rest of the participants. Your own tile will now be included next to the rest of the participants. Don't know why that's two sentences. Yeah, I, that's the one thing that I hate about Zoom. It's like I don't need to see myself as big as someone else. And that's what creates Zoom fatigue for me is like you're, you're really aware of your own you know, mirror image. And Teams having it as little down on the right hand side, little side bit, just so you can make sure you're in frame is useful. I want to see everyone else. I don't want to see myself. So that then you're taking real estate away that could be used for someone else. So not keen on that one. Customization of the gallery. Users can adapt the gallery to their needs or preferences. Customization options include gallery sizes. So you can choose the maximum number of tiles that are represented per page. Now I'm not a massive fan of pages either. I quite liked it when there were just four people on the screen and it just showed you the last four people to speak. So being able to like, place move people around as they're speaking which zoom doesn't do and if it does then let me know in the comments below but every time i've used it you're then like if you've got a lot of things you're like sort of scrolling through pages to see who's speaking which is really annoying unless you flip it onto another view which is like just show me the person that's speaking but then they're too big it's like well i want to see still see the gallery but a gallery made up of the most likely people to speak or the last few people to speak so hopefully the pages thing isn't taking that away. You can change the placement of your own tile. So for users who prefer to keep themselves separated from the rest of participants, you can change that, which I will be doing because I don't like it. But I'm hoping I don't need to do it every single time because that'd be really annoying. Uh, prioritizing videos, you can turn off the thing that they've just made the default. So you can, for users who want to give high weight to participants with a video on, you can turn that on. But again, not sure if that's default every single time. And then there's a the meeting room size you can change as well. So they've changed loads of defaults 
and then giving the option to turn them off. And I'm just hoping that turning them off will turn them off for every future meeting, because I'm not sure about some of those ones that borrow from Zoom, where, in my opinion, Teams is already better. And then last little bit on SharePoint before we go on to OneNote is that they're bringing out of the box document library templates. So if you want some metadata and you don't know what to put in there, then you can create, when you create a new document library, it says either from an existing library, from a blank library, or for some templates. Now, like a lot of things in Microsoft template land, I'm not sure how useful these are gonna be because the whole point of having metadata is that it maps to whatever process you want it to do. And it seems like a lot of IT pros and because of Microsoft, to be fair, seem to forget, like SharePoint document libraries seem to forget that people are using Teams. So yeah, you can create loads of cool things in SharePoint and have loads of metadata. Unless people keep them up to date, then they're gonna, gonna break. And there's not a great way of integrating that into the files bit of Teams because they're, as soon as you create a new document library, it's by default not gonna show up in a channel unless you go and add cloud storage or if you add it as a tab. So there are some use cases obviously where that is gonna be beneficial and useful, but for most things, I would say you're better off going Teams first because that's how people are mostly gonna use files. But this is more useful because I guess people aren't really sure what you can do with metadata in SharePoint. However, sometimes you might need a list rather than a document library, which isn't shown up in the template, obviously, because it's assuming you know what you're doing when you create a document library. And there's only three templates shown in the uh, screenshot so far. So hopefully they'll update and bring some of those on. Also, which not mentioned, is that it includes some flows, prepackaged Power Automate flows that can be skipped or completed depending on the user's needs. That's for the invoices template and the media library. So you still have to go through and tailor it to what you want to do for that sign off, but it's hopefully an easier way to get you into that, which you can build off rather than starting from scratch. So on to the last update, which is what's new and what's coming to OneNote on Windows. So to be honest, I've completely checked out of all the different naming things that's going on in OneNote. It's like trying to keep up with the fast and the furious naming conventions. Like we start with numbers and then you get so far and then just change it back to the fast and the furious. And then there's like fast and furious without the the. It's the same with OneNote. So I've just completely checked out of the naming on OneNote. But there's enhanced text, pen and ink gestures, which is useful being able to convert your writing into text live is coming to OneNote which Apple have had for a while you can delete text by scribbling over it there's text prediction which is in Word and I'm not sure why I can't just make things system wide as they're doing it so you can tab and, and complete things the new layout options which is funny because they went from like having stuff down the sidebar to having stuff at the top and that was the main difference between two versions of OneNote on Windows and now they're so you can have either, which uh, I guess is the best of both worlds. You can just pick which one you want. Opalette's obviously coming to OneNote, like it's coming to every other app in Microsoft 365 ecosystem. And you can preview stream videos in line, which is pretty useful. So like the one that we saw coming to Teams, you can now do that in OneNote as well. Before we go, remember to, if you like the video to give it a thumbs up, click the subscribe button and the bell icon to get notified every time I release a new video, which is at least every Tuesday. Thanks for watching so far. I'll see you in the next one.